Please stay standing as we turn now to God's word and continue in our series that began with the open tomb and looked at the open heavens yesterday, last week rather, the, the very reality of what happens when God moves among his people by the power of spirit, of his spirit, the work of revival, of renewing hearts to love Christ and of drawing sinners unto himself that they would trust and believe in his son. With that in mind, we look now to uh, Acts chapter 2, starting in uh, verse 42 to 47. This is where we'll spend our, uh, our uh, time in the next few weeks uh, through this series. And this is what, what uh, Luke says in Acts 2. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. This is God's word. Please pray with me. Father, we look to your word to understand the church, what it is to be the church. And we ask that by the power of your spirit and through your word and through your messenger this morning, you would speak mightily to our hearts, both individually and corporately, that we would be the church that you've called us to be. We pray for Pastor Trent. You'd give him great power to speak by your spirit, the very truths your word for the good of this church and for the advance of your gospel in this place and beyond. To the glory of Christ we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. The tomb is open. Jesus is risen. This means that heaven is open. We have access to the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit. Because Christ is risen, the church is a people who live for Him. With open Bibles, open hands, and open hearts. Once again, we acknowledge and celebrate that the tomb is open. Christ is risen. He's ascended into heaven, and he's opened up the heavens, and he's given the gift of the Holy Spirit to all those who ask him and who receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Well, I'm excited to continue this series today because I I saw last week how the Word was working in the life of one of our people. I I didn't ask her permission to share this story, so I'll just tell you one of our, uh, a young lady in our congregation came up after the first service and she was in tears. And I just thought, this is one of those marks that God is working. It's not always a mark, but it's one of those marks where God is working in a person's heart when her heart was broken for the lost in our community. And she was wondering, what are we doing to reach the people who are down in Mercado? And what are we doing to reach the people around in our own community who feel like they have everything, but but we know they don't because they don't have Jesus? And it so was encouraging to me. And I just, I pray as we've been asking for more, more of God's Spirit, more brokenness over our own sin, more joy in the work of grace in our lives by Jesus, more brokenheartedness over the lost in our community. This is what we're asking for. We're asking for more. Well, I want you to imagine with me for a moment 
story that Eugene Peterson tells. And we're imagining a warehouse. This is an enormous warehouse, and there are people who live in this warehouse. They were born in this warehouse, and they've been in this warehouse every day for their entire lives. They've never been outside of the warehouse. Everything they need is in it. There are no doors to the warehouse, but there are some windows. Unfortunately, these windows are so covered with dirt and grime, you actually can't see anything out the windows, and so no one ever does look out. Everything is just self-contained inside the warehouse. Imagine one day that a a little child pulls up a stool over next to one of those windows, and he gets a a, a rag, and he begins to rub off the window, and, and for the first time, he sees outside the warehouse. And what he sees out there are people. He had no idea there were people out there. And and he invites some of his friends to come over and they all climb up and they're looking out the window and they see these people outside. And the next thing they know, they see people pointing upwards. And so this little group of friends, they all look upwards and all they see is the roof of the warehouse. And they wonder, why are these people pointing up at the roof? What they don't realize is that these people are actually pointing to the sky. And in the sky is an airplane passing overhead, and they're talking about the airplane passing. But but from the warehouse, they don't know that there's a sky out there, let alone an airplane flying in it in heavens that extend far beyond it. All they know is this little world inside. But imagine what would happen if these kids found a way to get out of the warehouse, to open a door and to go outside and to see what's out beyond the walls, they would look up and for the first time would see the expanse of that sky. They would see a new reality that's actually truer than the one they've been living in, even though it's the only reality they'd ever known to that point. And they could never go back into the warehouse the same again. This is what happens when we open the Bible. We've been living in a particular kind of construct, a material kind of a world where all that there is is what we see around us. And and suddenly at some point in our lives, somebody opens the Bible to us and we discover for the first time that there is a world beyond that we did not know about. And a truth is revealed to us in that open Bible that we couldn't know except that God chose to reveal it to us. And once that truth is opened up, and it's not just simply opening the Bible, it's, it's the work of the Spirit to open the Bible to us so that we can actually see and understand what is there. But once the Spirit opens that Bible to us, we can never be the same again. What happens when the Holy Spirit moves on a people or a person is that they begin to see for the first time what they couldn't see before. And then an appetite develops, a hunger develops for the Word of God, and they can't get enough. And this is the problem with so much of contemporary spirituality that oftentimes masks itself as Christian spirituality, is that it doesn't have anything to do with the Word of God. Eugene Peterson, again, he hits the nail on the head when he says that there is an enormous interest these days in the soul. In the church, this interest in the soul is evidenced in a revival of attention in matters of spiritual theology, spiritual leadership, spiritual direction, spiritual formation. But there is not a corresponding revival of interest in our holy scriptures, the book that is given to us by the Holy Spirit. One of the ways that we can know that a, that a movement on a people is a movement of the Spirit of God is that there is a hunger that rises up for the Holy Word of God. This is how we know it's a work of the Holy Spirit because there is a passion for the Holy Scriptures. As John Calvin said many years ago, the Scripture is the school of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit is working in a people, they want to go to Holy Spirit school. And it's found in the Bible, God's Word. We open it, and there we discover a world that's far beyond, that far surpasses anything that we have known before. We're looking at this church in Acts 2, right after the day of Pentecost. And what we see in this church is a people who are actually living our vision statement. 
You might not know that, but they're living our vision statement. This is a loving family. When you read the verses about these people, how they're living together, that's what a loving family looks like. They are dependent on the Holy Spirit. They are committed to the Word. They're growing in grace, and they are reaching out in mercy. We're going to talk about this aspect of commitment to the Word, and I'm, I'm calling you today to recommit yourself to the Word of God, to the open Bible. And to do that, we're going to look at what it looks like in a community. So the first thing we see about these people is that they, are, they have a hunger for the Word of God. It's not insignificant that the first thing we're told, right after we're told that these people are, are saved by, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, they're baptized and added to the church, the very first thing we're told then in verse 42 is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. When the Holy Spirit comes in a person's life and moves in them, the first thing that we see is that they become devoted to the Holy Scriptures, the school of the Holy Spirit. Now, until that happens, we're not devoted to the Word. We're not committed to it. We don't have a hunger for it. But when it happens, for the first time, we understand what Jesus means when he was in the desert talking to the devil, and he quotes the book of Deuteronomy, and he says to the devil, man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Only as the Holy Spirit has moved in your life do you understand what it means that the, the word of God is food that it's as important to you as the actual food on your table, even more so. You're willing to miss regular food to feed on the Word. This is the evidence of the Spirit of God at work in a people. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. Newborn infants long for milk. Just part of being born is that you're hungry. Peter says, you people of God long, hunger, thirst for this pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up. Now what's interesting is that Peter says, you have a responsibility to long for this spiritual food. You're called to it. And yet at the same time, we recognize that this hunger is actually a gift of the Spirit of God. We can't we can't feign this hunger. It's something he must give. So, so what we must do then is to call out to God, God, give me more, greater hunger for your word. Give me what I can't do for myself. Make me hungry for your word. I can remember when I was uh, growing up reading the Bible from time to time, and, uh, and I would read it. It was the subject of, of, of some interest you know, there were, I would be interested in reading Revelation and, and some other pieces. It was, you know, something I wanted to be familiar with and know. I mean, but I wasn't hungry for it. In fact, when I read the Bible the most was when I was sitting in church like you guys are doing right now. And I was super bored with the preaching. So I would sit there in my seat and I would open the Bible up like this and I'd put my hands like this. And that way I could either read the Bible or I could sleep. And either way, it looked like I was doing something holy. Maybe some of you are there right now. All of your heads are up. I see you. I wasn't interested in the Word. I wasn't hungry for it. I read it because I didn't have anything else to do. I wasn't hungry for the preaching of the Word. Now, there wasn't anything wrong with the Word. And there wasn't anything wrong with the preaching. I just... I didn't have a hunger for it. I didn't have a taste for it. And then I can remember what happened when the Spirit of God moved in my life and brought me to new life. Like a newborn baby, I longed for the pure spiritual milk of the Word. Suddenly, I, I couldn't wait to go to church. I wanted to hear sermons. I couldn't believe I wanted to go hear sermons. 
I wanted to hear Bible teaching. I was listening to it on the radio. I, I wanted to read the scriptures. I wanted to go to Sunday school classes. I wanted, anytime the church doors were open, I wanted to be there because I was hungry for the word. Every day I found myself wanting to get up earlier and earlier because I, I wanted to have more time to read this book. You know what that feels like? You been there? And what I've found is that with time and age, some of that passion has waxed and, and waned. But when it wanes in my life, when that passion isn't there for me, I find that it's usually because something else is there that shouldn't be. When my hunger's not there, it's usually in my life because there's something else in its place that I'm feeding on something that's masking my hunger. So, if you've never felt this hunger, if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're always feeling like sermons are too long, if you're always feeling like, didn't we just read the Bible three days ago? If you don't know what this hunger feels like, let me tell you a couple of reasons why it might be. One, you very well may be dead. You're not, you've not been born again. You're still dead in your sin. And that might come as a shock to you because maybe you've been in church your whole life and you've been listening to sermons your whole life and you were baptized at one point and you take communion every week and you're dead. Don't be discouraged by that. Take heart. If you realize just now then maybe why I'm never really interested in the things of God is because I'm dead. Take heart because that's, most people don't ever know that they're dead. But the fact that you know that God's choosing to reveal that to you right now, that's the very first sign that he's actually bringing you to life. Call out to him right now. Say, God, come and make me alive. I want a hunger like this. I realize I'm dead and lost. Give me that hunger I cannot produce for myself. Give me that life I can't make for myself. Make me new in Jesus. He'll come and do it like a newborn infant. You'll, you'll, just, you'll be crying out for the word. Now, there's some of you who felt what it feels like to be hungry for the word, but you just, you're in a season right now where you're not hungry and you don't know why it is that you're not hungry. But... In our house, when it comes time for dinner and we sit down to the table and, and maybe myself or the kids, we're not, we're not hungry for what is an otherwise appetizing meal. Oftentimes, the reason for that is because we've been filling ourselves up with junk all afternoon. So when it comes time to eat the food that actually nourishes our body and gives us life, we don't have any appetite for it. Likewise, some of you may not be hungering for the word because you're consuming so much media, so much social media, so much activity, so much busyness, so much running, so much going from thing to thing. You're so busy, you think you're full, but you're not. You're just feeding on junk. And your soul is perishing for lack of nourishment of the word of God. And so long as you continue to fill yourself with junk, that hunger's never going to be there. And, and some of you, you're afraid to stop because you don't want to actually feel the hunger. So you keep masking it with stuff and busyness and activity. And, and the worst thing in the world for you is to have to stop in a waiting room and to sit there for 20 minutes and you forgot your phone and it's just you and you're there by yourself and you've got nothing to distract yourself. Maybe we need to intentionally fast from that which is keeping us full and keeping us from hungering for the Word of God. Maybe we need to back down our busyness for a season. Maybe we need to take a break from some of the things that are filling us up and quenching our hunger for the Word of God. And, and when we start to feel the discomfort, recognize it for what it is. You're longing for communion with your Maker. Seek Him in His Word those who are spiritually alive, hunger for the Word. We want to be a people hungry, who can't get enough, who are always seeking to be filled with the Word of God. The second thing we see about these people is that 
they not only hunger for the word, but they devote themselves to the word. They devote themselves to the word. Listen to what it says in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. First thing, note that they devoted themselves. It does not say they were devoted. This is an important distinction, and I'll tell you why. As I was studying the text this week, what I kept doing in my brain was changing those words. It says they devoted themselves, and I kept changing it to they were devoted. And I even wrote it into the sermon on accident because I kept changing it. And I realized it's so important that we get these words right. Here's what happens in your brain when you think they were devoted. You say, oh, that's great. They were devoted. They were first century people. They were Jewish people. It's just something they were. That's just who they are. They're just devoted. And we begin to think that being devoted is just something that happens to us. And what the text says is not that they just were devoted randomly and you just happen to be not devoted randomly. They were devoted because they were making a conscious decision to devote themselves to the Word day after day. Devotion doesn't happen accidentally. It's a decision. Now, the word devotion shows up a few different times in the New Testament. It means a couple of different things that are really closely related. Sometimes devotion is used to talk about a commitment to to a particular person. Sometimes devotion is used to talk about uh, an exclusive focus on an idea or an activity. We see the word devotion show up later in Acts in chapter 6, verse 4 where the apostles refused to wait tables, which essentially is doing mercy ministry for people. And the reason why is they say that we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. That means they're making an intentional decision to do one thing and not do other things that are actually good things. They were devoted. Devotion means to commit to one thing, to say yes to one thing, which means saying no to many other things, many things of which are good things. Tomorrow is the Boston Marathon. It's the greatest marathon in the world. I've run it several times. Pastor Todd's run it. A number of you have probably run it. My wife Emily is there to run it for the first time tomorrow. And here's why it's so great and why it's unlike every other marathon in the world. Because you don't just sign up to do the Boston Marathon. You have to qualify to do the Boston Marathon. Every other marathon you go to, unless it's the Olympic trials, what you'll find is that there are a wide range of people who are running that marathon. You'll have some people who are lifetime runners. You'll have some people who've been devoted to training. You'll have some first-time marathoners who've been training for their first. You'll have some people who decided last week that they're going to show up and do the marathon today. You've got a wide range of people showing up on the marathon. And not only that, but you often have a lot of half marathoners who use the same start line. So it's a mixed crowd. When you get to Boston, you have tens of thousands of people who are just as crazy as you are. They're, they're devoted. You don't get there by deciding last week that you're going to do it. You have to be devoted. Many people for years are training for this to get there. And many devoted runners aren't even able to get there because it's difficult. And so when you do get there and you encounter these people, what you find are everyone's just as crazily devoted. They've all been making a decision about running many days in a row for a long time in order to get to this place. They've been saying yes to this, and they've been saying no to a lot of other things along the way in order to get there. This is what devotion looks like. And what the effect of being amongst a people who are devoted is, you yourself get more devoted. You get more passionate. You get more committed to this thing because you see the beauty of it for what it is, what can happen when a person devotes themselves to something. We are called to be fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. This will not simply happen to you with time. 
Do you know how fully devoted followers of Christ become fully devoted followers of Christ? They fully devote themselves to Christ. You don't have to wait till tomorrow to do that or three years from now. You can fully devote yourself to Jesus today. It means saying to Jesus, you're first. I'm committed to you. I'm saying yes to you. And whatever else I have to say no to, to say yes to you, I'm in. You're what I want. Following you is what I want. I want to make you known in this world. So, so I'm happy because of this devotion to leave other devotions behind to let them fall in their appropriate places. These people were devoted. We are called to be devoted. That's a decision. Now specifically, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the word. Take a look there with me. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What is the apostles' teaching? Well, this is quite simple, actually. We know what the apostles' teaching is because it's actually written down for us in the Bible. It's called the New Testament. And this is so cool. These early Christians in Acts 2, they actually had the apostles there present with them, teaching them the Word of God, opening the Bible to them. We don't have the apostles present with us anymore, not in body, but but the Spirit of Christ that was working through the apostles has recorded the apostles' teaching in the Scriptures. And what we find when we read them and we study them to know them is that this New Testament part of the book is actually of one piece with the Old Testament part of the book. That the whole thing has been supervised and, and, and worked in th- by the Holy Spirit so that from Old Testament to New Testament, it's not two different books and two different stories and two different gods. It's a story of one God calling out one people, saving them through one Redeemer, Jesus Christ, filling them with one Holy Spirit, baptizing them into one holy church. Come, Lord. And raising us up, ultimately in one resurrection to a new heavens and a new earth. This is the one story. What's at the heart of the apostles' teaching? At the heart of the apostles' teaching is the good news of the gospel. You see, what the apostles do when they begin to open this book is they start expounding upon the Old Testament. And as they're teaching what the Old Testament says, they're showing how Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament is pointing to. That the sacrificial system, that the laws, that the ceremonies, that the feast days and Sabbaths, all of it is pointing to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And then they say, now call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Follow after him. Because he saved you, because of what he's done for you in the gospel, now now live your life in light of the fact that you've been made new, that you've been delivered from the domain of sin and death and darkness, and you're now a child of God. Now live your life in light of this new identity that's, that's been represented to you in your baptism and that you remember every week when you take the Lord's Supper or every month. This is who you are. This is what God has done for you. And here's what happens. When you begin to realize that all the things in your life that are problems ultimately come back to one problem, and that is your sin, then you increasingly hunger for the apostles' teaching because the apostles' teaching is the solution to your sin problem. The gospel, Jesus, the cross is the answer to your feelings of emptiness, to your lack of satisfaction, to your discontent, to your broken relationships, to your addictions. Jesus is the answer to them all. The apostles' teaching is this teaching us what it means to believe the gospel and to live in light of it every single day. And so this is the center of our teaching at Covenant Church is the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, devoted to the Word. So we hunger for the Word of God. We are devoted to the Word of God. 
The third effect of the Spirit moving upon a people is that they desire to master the Word. They desire to master the Word. They don't simply want to read it. They don't simply want to be familiar with its contents and to have a basic idea of where things are in there, that they want that. They actually want to master the Word. And how does one master the Word? It only happens through devoted study and intentionality, and not only study, but actually then applying what one has studied and begin to live in light of that which you have read and studied. Christians have known this from the beginning. That's why they've always been people of the book. Not just people of the book, but people of the open book. Origen, one of the early church fathers back in the three, third century, he writes to another early church father named Gregory, and this is what he says to him. Do you then, my son, diligently apply yourself to the reading of the sacred scriptures? Apply yourself, I say. For we who read the things of God need much application, lest we should say or think anything too rashly about them. And applying yourself thus to the study of the things of God, knock at its locked door and it will be opened to you. And applying yourself thus to divine study, seek aright and with unwavering trust in God the meaning of the Holy Scriptures which so many have missed. Even Origen himself in some key areas missed some of the important things. But his point stands that we are to be a people who seek to master the word through intentional study. There's a word for this we use in theology to talk about this kind of study. It's called exegesis. You Maybe you've heard that. You're always wondering, why are people, why are people talking about exegesis? Who's that? exegesis. It refers to reading out of the text that which is in the text. The opposite is called eisegesis, where you're reading into the Bible something that's not actually there. Exegesis. We're bringing out of the text what is there. I love how Eugene Peterson describes exegesis. He says, exegesis is loving God enough to stop and listen carefully to what he says. Exegesis is loving God enough to stop and listen carefully to what he says. It means I don't just simply read across the words and and flutter across it, but I actually take time and I pause and I say, Lord, what are you saying in, in this text, in these words? We believe in something called verbal plenary inspiration. It's another one of those words that why, why is, what in the world is that? Here's what it means. We believe that not just the ideas of Scripture, but every single word of Scripture is inspired by God, that the words matter. It's why it's important that we take time to recognize that the text didn't say they were devoted. It says they devoted themselves because God is communicating to us through words. So we want to devote ourselves. We want to seek to master this book, and that happens only through years, a lifetime, dare I say, of intentional, careful, exegetical study of the Scripture. Peterson writes again, the more mature we become in the Christian faith, the more exegetically rigorous we must become. That might seem contrary to you, but listen to why he says this. This is not a task from which we graduate. These words given to us in our Scriptures are constantly getting overlaid with personal preferences cultural assumptions, sin distortions, and ignorant guesses that pollute the text. The pollutants are always in the air, gathering dust on our Bibles, corroding our use of language, especially the language of faith. Exegesis is a dust cloth, a scrub brush, or even a Q-tip for keeping the words clean. He is so right. We must keep coming back to the text day after day, year after year, and saying, Speak, O Lord, your servant is listening. I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm I'm not going to assume I know what it means. I'm going to listen to hear you actually speak through these words. And and this careful study we're talking about is, is slowing down enough 
loving God enough to let Him actually speak to us through His Word, to break through, to, to clean off that dust. One of the saddest things that I encounter as a pastor is occasionally meeting people who say, I used to read the Word every day, but I don't do that anymore. I mean, I've been through it a number of times. I know what's in there. I used to go to Bible study, but I don't do that anymore. I mean, I pretty much have heard everything there is to hear. A person who says that, maybe you've said that, what you're, that is, there is no more clear sign that you have not mastered the Word than that you have ceased to study it. Because what happens when you cease to give this careful attention to, to exegetical study is that all of the distortions of your own sin now are coloring your reading of the text. They're coloring your recollection of the text. All of the cultural assumptions in the world around you are shaping your reading of the text. Brothers and sisters, how else can so much of the church have suddenly decided that homosexual marriage is according to Scripture, except that the cultural assumptions have clouded the reading of the Word? How can we be so careless about immigrants and other people who are helpless, except that we've allowed cultural assumptions to shade our reading of what the text actually says? How can we be so thoughtless about the way we tend to hoard things, except that we've allowed the culture to keep us from hearing what the Scripture actually says. None of us are immune to this. And this is why the Spirit of God gives us a hunger for the Word, so that we'll keep coming back to it, and we'll let it break through our assumptions. We'll let it break through our prejudices. And no matter what the culture is saying, we'll say, Lord, I'm taking you at your word. I don't, I don't get this. This is very countercultural. but we desire to master the Word. There's more than this, though. You see, the reality is we want to be mastered by the Word. Mastering the Word actually is not something that will ever happen. We want to, but it'll never happen. More important than even mastering the Word is being mastered by the Word. We want to be mastered by it. You see, this Word that comes to us, it's not a companion. It's not my friend that goes along the journey with me. It's not a subject of disinterested study, which I venture into from time to time to see, well, here's what the newspaper says about that, and here's what the commentator on TV says about that, and here's what God says about that, and whose do I like? This is the words of the King from on high for His people. We... We, we submit to it. We can wrestle with it, try to understand what it says, try to make sense of it, but at the end of the day, we bow the knee to it, for it is the words of our King, and He is supreme and sovereign, and that's true for everybody, whether you're a Christian or not. These are the words of the King. This is His call, His invitation, and His command, and His promise. And to neglect what it says... is to rebel against the king. And his invitation is that if you lay down the arms of your rebellion and submit yourself to him, he'll give you new life and a hunger for this word, and you'll actually begin to love the things of God. Peterson writes, Christians feed on Scripture. Holy Scripture nurtures the holy community as food nurtures the human body. Christians don't simply learn or study or use Scripture. We assimilate it, take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized into acts of love, cups of cold water, missions into all the world, healing and evangelism and justice in Jesus' name, hands raised in adoration to the Father, feet washed in company with the Son. This is what happens when a people are mastered by the Word. They begin to reflect it. 
They begin to look like it. And when you're looking like the Word, you're looking like Jesus, who is the Word. This is what God's doing in His church. This is what He's desiring to do in you and me. It's what He's desiring to do at Covenant Church. When we recognize and we celebrate that the tomb is open and empty, that Christ is risen on high, He's seated at the highest place in all the universe with all authority given to Him. He's poured out His Holy Spirit on the church, and now He's making a people who live with open Bibles, who are committed to the Word. It means that we're hungry for it. It means that we are devoted to it. It means that we aim to master it, and even more so, that we desire, by His grace, to be mastered by it. Do you know this risen Jesus? Are you open to Him? Invite Him to come and give more. Let's pray together. And now, Lord, we do ask for more. I pray that Covenant Church would be a place where people cannot contain themselves, but they, they cannot keep themselves from your word, but they hunger for it more and more every day. That we'd have a fresh wave of people who've, who've given up on the Grow in the Word 2018 campaign say, I want to devote myself to the word again. I want to step back into that. I want to begin to, to say no to some other things in my life so I can say yes to you and your word. I want to begin to, to put away some of those things that are, that are quenching my hunger and masking it and keeping me from fellowship with you through your word. And Lord, I want to, I want to return to you and, and feel again what it feels like to be a newborn baby longing for pure spiritual milk. Lord, I pray that you would bring that hunger here. I pray that your spirit would move here, that we'll know you're moving here because your people want more and more of your word. I thank you for the grace that's already evident at Covenant Church that this is a people who love the scriptures. But I pray that we would love it more and that loving it more, we would live it more, that the world might know that you are king and that you stand ready to receive all who will trust and believe in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.